Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. Tonight we're going to be looking at something you don't see very often in the US. It is MacLabor STM310. And if you said what, you're not alone. It is not very common machine in the US for the same reason that some other machines are more common in Europe. It used to be produced in Hungary back in the Soviet Union time. Back in the Soviet times, each Soviet country was given a particular task depending upon its capabilities and industry. And Hungary was charged with making professional tape recorders. For the, European, for the Eastern European countries. The company was called MacLabor, which stands for Mechanical Laboratory. And it made several products, including reel-to-reel -reel machines and later some portable reporter cassette recorders. Since I'm somewhat of a collector, the first time I saw this machine on the internet, I was hooked. I wanted to have it. It has this unusual look to it. Nothing like that existed on our market. So I was naturally very, very curious about this machine. And since I have a very close friend living in Russia, I talked to him and I asked him to scope the horizon for me looking for nice, clean machine of that model. So he started looking around and most machines were in very poor shape. But eventually he found one in Moscow, about 300 kilometers from his town. Through grapevine, because he was one of those Russian audio lovers not quite the audio file, but somebody who had interest in audio. And he had some people he knew. So that person in Moscow responded, and he said he had very nice, mint, virtually unused machine in his possession. And on top of that, this machine was one of the later models. You know, like most companies, MacLabor went through several iterations of this model. So you will see machines with five round control buttons here. And then you will see the machine with four round buttons. Then you see machine with five square buttons. And finally you arrive at four square buttons. At least this is the way I understand this progression. So long story short, I told my friend to get this machine for me. And he did. He paid money and he received the machine. As soon as he received it, he started noticing something strange. It was not mint machine per se. Obviously, it had some issues and somebody was inside trying to fix those issues. And he didn't do a particularly good job, leaving behind a lot of mess. So that was a very upsetting discovery. And a friend of mine called the guy in Moscow and told him about this. The response that came was very typical of that kind of situation. The guy basically told him to go pound the sand. If you don't like it, you don't have to buy it. No apologies, no nothing. So at this point I had to make a choice and a friend of mine already invested time and money into this machine. So I told him, okay, go ahead, ship it to me. We'll see if he can fix it. We'll make it work. A few weeks later, two very large and heavy boxes showed up. This machine was taken into two pieces. 
And that's a very strong statement to its modularity. You see, the machine was designed to be extremely modular. So in any studio environment, the downtime would be reduced. On this machine, pretty much any assembly can be taken out and replaced in a matter of a couple minutes. For example, the whole capstan assembly, the motor with the servo board, comes up very easily. You just undo a couple of screws and it pulls out. It connects naturally through its fixed connections in both parts. The same is true of the real motors. They also come out as complete assemblies, can be replaced in a matter of minutes. The same is true also of electronics. And ultimately, the whole structure is like a sandwich. There is a bottom portion, which houses power transformer and main portion of the power supply. And it simply unbolts with, I believe, four screws from the top portion. And in a matter of a couple of minutes, you have two assemblies. Each one can be worked on separately. They can be connected with cables for troubleshooting. But it presents a very, very convenient way of addressing the issue. I quickly fell in love with this machine. I love its symmetrical layout, its general look, the choice of colors to the case, and the way it's operated, when it operated. When it arrived, it was at best intermittent. It was clear something was really wrong with the capstan drive. So I had to take it apart. And pretty soon it was obvious. That servo circuit board was full of very old Soviet era integrated circuits. And those bastards were fa failing left and right. It took me a few days and I replaced all those semiconductors with their Western analogs. Fortunately, there was one-to-one -one correspondence. It was easy to find the match. And it started working. So that was a good start. But I was not out of the woods yet. The machine still displayed some nasty character. One particular section started smoking, and it took me quite a while to figure it out. You know, it, it is inside a very sophisticated machine. For example, you see those tension sensor rollers, and they're driving variable capacitors. The whole servo system is fed 240 kilohertz AC signal, and those controls vary the level of that signal going to the control module. So overall, it's a very sophisticated and very effective system, and it works very well when it works. When it arrives to you, this is the shape you see. So there are no turntables. This is a typical professional machines of some generations. So you have two choices. You can have the trident that bolts in. Or a platter lock. You can also bolt it in. <coughs> Regarding the pancakes, I was promised a set of brand new pancakes. But then the news came that the guy screwed them up. He was trying to make them better and he busted them completely. So instead of two brand new ones, I got two lightly used pancakes. They're okay. They're pretty straight. So I don't complain much. So this is the way it looks when you're trying to use the platters. As you can see, it can take up to 12 inches in diameter pancakes, which is nice. If you would rather use reels, then you simply re replace those locks with tridents and you're all set. So here we see two 12-inch reels comfortably sitting on this machine. 
So if that's your choice, please go ahead. They will work marvelously well. Of course, if you are like me and you prefer the pancake situation, then you can put those locks in and it will work marvelously well. One thing I would like to mention about this particular configuration is this bi-directional rewind button. You see it got directions right and left. And this knob also has left and right triangles. And the way it works, you engage this button and then you define the direction by moving this knob. It's a very nice system. It's used very commonly on some professional tape machines, especially in Europe. And it's getting some use to it. But once you master it, it becomes natural. Another feature here is this machine has butterfly heads. I'm not a fan of butterfly heads. I don't like them. But here they seem to be working quite well. My first attempt at trying to get some sound out of this machine ended up in fiasco. There was no sound. I called my friend in Russia and he explained, he forgot to mention to me that they, they changed the gender on the connectors. So now what normally is input connector is output connector. Okay, so that's nice. So I made some special cables. And I started using the machine. And it sounded good, but I was still puzzled by some low-level buzz. And it took me a while at look, of looking at schematics. They were drawn, needless to say, in Hungarian way. It was very difficult to read those schematics. But eventually I realized that in addition to swapping the genders, they also messed around with pin allocations. They were totally different from normal XLR pin allocation. So once I discovered that fact, I connected the cables the way they wanted it, and the machine started sounding marvelously nice. It is one of the good sounding machines out there. In one test, which I mentioned before, my multiple machine recording test, this machine scored near the top in terms of its recording quality. That was nice, but I kept listening to it and something started bothering me. I liked the sound, but something was not quite right. You know, we all know the situation that you can make most people like your wine if you just add a little bit of sugar to it. So it sounded like something like that was happening here. I believe the machine was adding just a little bit of something that made it sound pleasant. Well, I don't like that kind of addition. So at this point, I say, I will record on other machines before I record on this one. It has beautiful sound in recording, don't take me wrong, but I think it does something not quite right there. In terms of its reproduced quality, sound quality, it's actually quite good. It's got very extensive array of controls for calibration, and don't even try to understand what each control means because the pictures they have associated with controls are just not logical at all. So you need the manual and you need to read it and study it and learn your way around this machine. And once you do it, it actually produces very, very good results. The calibrations are nearly perfect. Now, going back to the same general question. If you live in America, should you buy such a machine? I know it's attractive and it is popular in some parts of Europe, but should you indulge in that? 
And my answer again would be probably not. Because this is a machine, you will probably never find somebody to fix if it fails. It looks very nice and it works good. But is it really something I recommend everybody? No. There are more reliable and probably more readily available machines that you should consider before you consider that one. But if you are a collector like I am sometimes, definitely look at that machine. It's very attractive. It works very well. It looks like nothing that anybody else has. So thank you for watching. I hope you found something interesting in this uh, short story. And now let's go back to music. Oops, of course I made a mistake. My preamp is still sitting in mute. So here we go again.
couple more words about this machine. It has two speeds, 30 inches and 15, I'm sorry, it's 15 inches and 7.5. I always get confused about the systems, okay. It's got two track system, of course. And as you can see, it has no meters, no adjustments, no switches for the sound. It relies on the external console for doing all that kind of stuff. Just a couple of more close-up shots of this beautiful machine. Here is the calibration panel with all those cryptic pictures. Fortunately, the manual has good description of those controls. A brief demo of operating the rewind system. So thank you again for watching. I hope you like this little machine the way I like it. See you again. Bye-bye.